the geek set podcast the only podcast that blend hip-hop culture and geek culture together i'm your boy deuces and this is one-on-one with deuces the place where i speak of creators curators and people that you should know and right now man we speaking with one of the dopest people on the net it's 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 been it's been waiting to happen because this is like two it's like a fusion dance it's like the geek set <laughs> eagle crew plus the arcade tokens or the cloudy village but we have patrick cloud on the building how you doing man what's going on man hey you have a really good voice for this Thank you, bro. <laughs> you want to know what's funny? So, like, this is where I, well, one, relate to you a lot. Because, like, you are, to me, the living proof of working your way up, right? And then kind of just falling right. into this, right? Because of, like, your origin story and kind of with you and everything that you did, right? So, mm-hmm. me, I come from music. I do music. I've been doing music for the most part of my life. Oh, and nice. Before podcasts started popping off, I wanted to do a podcast, but then I couldn't get any of my hip hop buddies to do one with me. And I, and I knew I couldn't float it myself. So I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But I still wanted to do podcasting. So then right. once podcasts blew up, I'm like, damn, like, OK, everybody talking about hip hop. What else can I do? Right. And so I was like, well, I love like geek shit, anime, podcast, I mean, anime, comic books, video games. And I was like, you know what's not because I, I watch a whole bunch of geek property. And I'm like, you know what's not there? that black geek like everybody thinks about like urkel when they think the black geek but i'm like right. but there's a lot of people that look and sound like me that talk about this geek shit and like when you hear it it sounds like barbershop talk like right. we, like it could be me and you we could be arguing about batman and superman and people would swear that it's beef but it's like nigga no man batman and whoop superman ass and you like nigga what like it's like that but i was like we don't have that so i was like i want to provide that i want to be that person in there um so it's like I started podcasting and it just started to catch on. And it was like, it wasn't never my passion, but now it has become my passion because I'm meeting right. people. I'm giving people the opportunity to geek out outside of all the other things. Like I've had some dope conversations with like Van Lathan where people, all they want to talk about is him checking Kanye. But when he gets my platform, we just spend the whole hour and a half talking about comic books. And people are like, damn, I didn't even know Van Lathan was into comics like that. Right. So it's like, it's that representation. Um, So when I see you and what you do, because one, you are a black geek as well, but you go against the stereotype of what mass media shows us. You're not Urkel, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? You're like, there's cool motherfuckers in this space. And and so it's one of those things that I immediately gravitated towards what you were doing. And then when I found out about the music and just everything, I was like, yeah, I definitely rock with Pat. Like, this is is my guy. (laughs) But I was like, I wanted to make sure you knew that. Yeah, that people rock with you like that heavily, which I'm pretty sure you know. I no, I I appreciate you saying that a lot. And you know, I it's it's cool that you brought up um barbershop talk because it's like the the cool thing about the word geek is that it it only implies the person's level of interest. You know what I mean? Like it, we when we saw mainstream media and we saw Urkel, the classic geek or nerd was obsessed with school and math and stuff like that. But when you think of being a geek, you can be a geek for anything. And you were talking about barbershop talk. What do they talk about in there? Sports. Mm -hmm. I talk about this with my friends all the time, specifically the arcade tokens. People who know all the stats of the 95 Bulls and the the 86 Lakers, you're a geek. (laughs) that That is a nerd. So it's just like, People kind of like picked and choose like what's cool to be a nerd for and what isn't. And video games, you were if you were a geek for gaming or anime or something like that, you were written off as geek. But people didn't even realize how geeky they were for cool stuff like sports, you know. So it's 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 cool that it's like you know a thing a thing now, you know. And, and podcasts definitely help that. 
Yeah, and you want to know what's funny? So literally, so you see this, this is our brand, our flagship brand called mm -hmm. Geek. And it's called Geek, and our slogan is do what you love. And that is the actual definition of what we said. We use that all the time. I said, we watch sports and we like, oh, LeBron's dope. But you talk to Shannon Sharp or Skip Bayless on, you know, and they're telling you, oh, well, LeBron's dope because of this, that, and the third, and this PER stat. And you're like, I just thought he was, I thought he was just, he could just jump good. Yeah, <laughs> you know the science behind that man's knees? You're a geek. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's what, so that's exactly what we're trying to do is trying to change what geek is. Like, you can be a geek of beer. You can be a geek of, like you said, of clothing, of shoes, like this geek is not just tech and you know math and stuff like that so it's just a level of interest so you know if you want to be like the the most coolest people are are, are geeks of something you know what i mean it doesn't you're cool people like compare how much of a geek you are and like they try to adjust your level of coolness but you can be both or you can have neither you can have neither you can be a geek you could be totally not cool and not be a geek of anything so uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely like what you guys are doing because that's a that's a cool slogan for the word geek for sure. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of the things, like I said, that's why I created this space too because I, there's people that I feel like for the most part, they're just like working on their craft or they're behind the scenes. And I wanted to be a person to kind of give them that opportunity to kind of let's, you know, chop it up and celebrate what they've been doing because one of the things about you that has been very, very impressive and really dope is that you are doing stuff that is just like was a part of your upbringing or things that you were around, but it is stuff that is shifting the culture. The fact that, you know, like dad jokes got on TV and you was doing it with Mario Lopez and at that big range and level, it's just like, you know, even though people been doing dad jokes, the way that you guys did it and packaged it and made it a thing, it just really dope. And it is like, oh yeah, but this is part of black culture. Like roast me is part of black culture, but you made it something to the point where now you got toast me out here for random reasons. <laughs> but it's just like, it's just, it's just so dope to see. And even when you talk about it, you're just like, well, yeah, I put this together because I thought it was dope and things like that. And I feel like you haven't had that opportunity to sit back and really be like, all right, well, we are doing something that's really, really dope here. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, we just are, I think our out, first of all, thank you for that. Um, our output is so, is so demanding and I wouldn't say demanding. I, I just think that it's just consistently been uh, a lot to the point where, you know, just talking about all deaf, like all deaf closed down and was rebought before half the internet knew because we were still rolling out like a lot of people don't know like they closed the door on a Monday I was there till like Thursday <laughs> because there was like three people that were still like uh shooting and editing and we rolled it out till like October and then I think like like a week two a couple weeks before um we ran out of stuff it was bought again and we were kind of like going again so we just have such like a a pretty a cool level of, of output it wasn't really until it was rebought again under Culture Genesis that we really realized how far we went because, you know, at first it was just like we were just trucking ahead, trucking ahead, trucking ahead, trucking ahead. And it was just under that like startup company thing. And then before we knew it, it was popping and then it, and then it shut down. So a lot of us, it was a blessing in disguise because then a lot of us had to kind of figure out our own ways and you know we got like ownership and 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 uh that was drilled in our head and then like starting our own stuff so that by the time it came back um you know we were not only stronger for for the the brand but it was also just like um you know a position where we can kind of like look at how strong the brand was because like 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 i said before we didn't get a, a lot of chances to kind of like look back but you know when it you know there's a bidding war for it and now it's like all these we're working with like Modelo and Sprite and all these like bigger, bigger companies. It's just like we're, we're seeing we're seeing the impact that we had and we're just taking it to the next level by, you know, doing sub channels like, you know, cannabis and gaming. And we just dropped Latino and women. And, you know, um, I just had a meeting today with uh, some companies that we're working with in India and, and Africa. So it's like the more we're the more we're sort of like incubating these these things. The more that people are noticing them and you know thanks to uh just the the reach of the, the people and not only that like our sales team and, and our and our ceos and stuff like that 
where we're seeing the impact on um, a bigger level than just like, you know, like um, kind of like face to face. Cause yeah. like we were just in Atlanta and we were blown away by how big all deaf was. And just like our, us as individual creators were, uh, and just like, kind of like the love that we got out there. Cause you know, we're from Los Angeles. It's very easy to like work in a bubble and everybody else is doing the same thing. It's just, everybody's do being an entertainer and, you know, it's kind of on the bougie side. So the love ain't really the same unless it's like, you know, very, very homegrown. And, you know, I always say that all the love is South of the 10. <laughs> Maybe when, once you go North of the t our, you know, our 10 freeway, the the love is very very scarce um but yeah it's it's just a whole different place so i'm sorry that was a very long-winded answer just of saying like we didn't get to know at first but now it's kind of like we're, we're getting like a lot of um fruits from the labor of the cultures that we set well i mean let me let, let me put it in perspective like this i'm from milwaukee wisconsin and you okay. know doing this podcast from the crib and i've been fortunate enough to interview a lot of people from all deaf um, awesome and every time one of you guys are on, people, the way, you probably have dealt with this before, like the way certain people talk to you, like you in general, that you've known your whole life, when certain things happen, they talk to you like it's like it's like you're famous or you're on. So when I'm talking to you guys, they treat it like it's like I'm speaking to a Denzel. Like I, I had Meg on, Meg was highly, highly requested. I remember when I first did the interview with Kev, Everybody would hit it. Yo, bro, y'all about to be on. And I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you start thinking about that. And it's funny because, like, that wasn't even my best interview that I did with Kev. You know, and, and my, my best interview, I think, I tell this date was Cynthia Luciette. People loved her. But it was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you start posting stuff, you know, just like, hey, this is what I'm about to be doing. The all deaf love that people get, just even just from my Milwaukee people, like, people mm -hmm. look at y'all like, oh, my gosh, you got that? Like, bro, y'all niggas about to do it. Like, it's it's that level. And <laughs> I I love it. I, I don't understand it yet, for <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I definitely appreciate it. Our fans go so, so hard for us. And I think that... I think it's just because I, we've 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 gotten to know them on a on a whole other level. Like, I feel like um, the individual creator is hit or miss in terms of the um, the people that they get. You know, you kind of can decide right away um, if you like an individual creator. But I feel like what us coming together and and doing all deaf really did was. It, it helped. I, I feel like it helped people on a different level because, OK, for instance, like if you're having like a, a shitty day or if you're going through something really, really bad, or if you're um, just bored at work, it can be as simple as that. Going and, and checking out a creator is, is a lot different than going and checking out a hub of creators. You know what I mean? Because one is just like, you're gonna get what you like about them, but in a, on, a, on a channel that's really for the culture and really like kind of like trying to speak, trying our hard, hardest to speak for everybody. And, um, and it's a mixture of a lot of creators that you either don't know or you like individually. I, I like to think of it as like Super Smash Bros. Since we're, talk, since we're talking about geek shit anyways, you know what I mean? Like Mario was doing okay on his own. Like Mario Bros is gonna sell out, you know, Link, it, it, Legend of Zelda shit is going to sell out. But what they were able to tap into was seeing everybody together, bringing in all these different fan bases and new fan bases, like the amount of people who, when Metal, when Solid Snake was a, a downloadable character, people were like, oh, the guy from Smash Bros. Nobody, there were so many kids that didn't play Metal Gear Solid. So it's just like the fact that they can even go back and be like, oh, this is trash, <laughs> is still something that Nintendo has infinite, like it, it's, they're just genius for that. So just as that, as a metaphor, you know, in, in terms of like social media, I kind of tried to, and you know, we all tried to curate a sort of like a Super Smash Bros for social media comedy. And I think that that's kind of why, just to bring it back, that's kind of why our, our fans um, are so full circle because like, even when we were going around New York, we were noticing that a lot of people who stopped us were at their jobs. You know what I mean? It would be like a lot of 
the like a lot of the like the dope people who work TSA um, over in New York, which is a, probably one of the most cracking TSAs I've ever seen. Um, you know, just like people at restaurants, people, just, you know, what I mean, because it's just like on a lot of these people either on their downtime, they're checking us out if they're going through just like something bad and they need to be cheered up, and that kind of gave them a, a a very special connection to us that a lot of one on one creators um, it takes them a very long time to get. <laughs> that you was like when you were talking about like your origin in general and you were saying that back then there was a moment where like you would only see the numbers but then it was one person who told you that like their sister was sick and she would watch you they would go to your page and look at your page for um content and see if you mm -hmm. that. that was the moment where you stopped looking at people as just the numbers and start saying like oh these are actually people watching it's not just oh, i got this many likes it was like okay there's actually people watching it. And I thought that that was a dope thing. Absolutely. No, that, that's cool. I, I used to I used to tell that story all the time. You're actually the first person besides me to tell that story. So that, that's that's super dope. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was that was a very, very big moment. I was in it was in Target off of La Cienega. <laughs> that was that was a very big turn point, because like you said before that, I was so obsessed in the, the numbers and the, the engagement and stuff. But once I started, once I realized that they were people um, not only did my, me looking at like, uh, my content, you know, obviously like after it's been posted that changed, but I really think that how I made content changed too, because I knew that I was making it for people and not for numbers. And that gets really, really confusing, especially when you're, you're, you're a new creator and you don't really know what to, to post yet. Or especially like in my, in my, uh, in my position where I was a new producer and, you know, obviously I was, I was making stuff for a company and a lot of times the pressure for numbers is immense. So a lot of times people take the easy way out and do something kind of hacky or they steal something or they'll go and um, do something that's kind of harmful to the culture. Like, I'm not even gonna lie, like a lot of the stuff we produced in our early uh, earlier days for All Deaf was very harmful to the culture because we, we yeah. didn't really know, you know, we kind of got you know, glossy eyed and it became about how, how popular and how shareable is this and how shocking or whatever. And, you know, it started with good intentions, you know, a lot of times like the for the first times and stuff like that, it started from a, a, a very interesting point of view. Like, you know, it was like uh, African-Americans change, uh, taste traditional African food for the first time. That's interesting to me because they're like learning something. But once those ideas dried out and the series was still popping, like, it, it, it's still kind of like the, the need for numbers can sometimes blind you into not making content that's really for the people you want it to be for or for the like the respect level that you want. So that's a battle I have all the time. Luckily, um, you know, a lot of companies trust me now. Um, but at, at first it was a lot of like, no, I don't feel comfortable doing this or but I'm, I am thankful for, for All Deaf because even today, like I, I work with producers who were around way back then and it impacted them the same way because once we've been behind the camera and we've posted that stuff, that was just like, we look back and we're kind of like, that, I would not have done that today. That's detrimental because there's X amount of producers that haven't done that and they're just, they have, they're not aware of it and they're just dropping harmful stuff. So it's good to have gone through that because we've stopped a couple of things <laughs> in its tracks. Like, nope, I, that that's, that's like all deaf 2000, you know, way back in the day. I'm not, I'm not going back to that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, to kind of give you reassurance from the fan perspective, we have seen the, the growth and the change from when it first, and then like when it, the reemergence of it. And I think that, you know, that's something that, you know, everybody grew, no matter what the case, everybody grew, but we see that. And, you know, even the things that you guys do, you know, even with the launch of All Deaf Women and hearing that story from Cynthia and Meg about, you know, like, yeah, they've been wanting to do this, it's just it never got launched. But then the second go around when everything was, you guys kind of relaunched and redid everything, it was more like, yes, go, why we should have been did this. And so it was like, we as fans, we see that growth, we're here for it, we love it and we champion it 100%. Um, Thank you. One of the things that you guys taught me too, and this is where, you know, where I think I really connect a lot. So in my process of this, I actually started this interview series, literally smack dab when the pandemic hit. And um, I don't know if you got a chance to meet her, meet her, but Crystal Bubbling is my homie from way back. She actually is a DJ 
she's been doing the black people um do um oh, she's gonna kill me for this uh dang it on the kevin stage app improv they, she's the host of the improv show oh okay I've, I've i've seen a couple episodes of that oh, okay that's dope her that's my homie homie she's a dj she knew me from music and everything and i started seeing her acting so this is where the like the connection helped and then it also kind of like started and steamrolled all of this so i've been trying to reach out to kev for the longest and i'm like i'm trying everything i can because you know what i'm saying i'm like all right i'm gonna get it i'm gonna find it and i couldn't and i knew that she knew kev and i was like but i often and i got to get out my head in this i often i'm so used to getting it out the mud that it's hard for me to ask for help sometimes Absolutely. So I reached out to her and I'm like, hey, can you just let Kev know he got an email and like, you ain't got to do nothing. Just let him know there's an email. I go ahead and do this. And she literally was like, nigga, do you need him? I was like, well, I do want to interview. She's like, all right, I'm going to ask him. And then within like an hour, you know what I'm saying? I was able to kind of get that interview. And nice. Kev was so dope that he was like, you know, once I did that, like I was able to get to here, CP, CT, like it just kept on going and going. And it's mm -hmm whole lot of stuff that helped out right so just doing that and linking up with Tahir he's had me on zooming with the homies twice and nice. what you guys taught me with that when I'm when I was on there you know everybody they the fan base assign people's emojis they connect with the fans you and Tahir personally you guys be doing things with the fans and stuff like that and I started watching that and I said damn I don't got any of this so I was like I want to start building that fan base where that way it mobilized. Because the one thing that I seen when watching Zoom with the homies and being on it, you can be in the chat and it'll be clouds flooded in the chat. Like you're not even, not even on screen. You can be anywhere. And, and the way that the stage crew, the Mora Mob, the Cloud Village, the way that they mobilize, that is something that I've been preaching to my team at Geek Set. And because like when I got on there, I didn't have emoji. And then somebody from the Mora Mob gave us the Eagle emoji. Then they named it our fan base, the Eagle Scout. So I'm like, look, we're going to keep that. We're going to keep on going and keep on moving with that. And now we're trying to mobilize the way that you guys do. So I watch a lot of the things that you guys do, not to necessarily, not to just bite off of it, but to learn what you guys are doing. Because I'm like, that is amazing. Because then you guys got something that you can count on. You can drop a merch and you're like, all right, I know Kyle Village is going to take care of this percentage of sales. So, and then you can bring that to companies and stuff like that and kind of continue to build. But if, even if that doesn't work with another company, you know, your fan base, you know, that you can rely on them, you know, that you can do something for them. And I just love that to, so much. And so it's like, that is something that I learned from all of you guys watching you guys very closely. And again, just being just how dope it was, how dope you guys are. Just even after chopping it up with y'all and even with Tahir reaching out to say, hey, you want to do this? You know, one time he had, he did a whole three minute shout out of my album. I didn't even ask for that. And he, <laughs> on Zooming with the homies, it was like, well, it was it was like a high, it, like that video, I think got like 60,000 views and it helped nice. my album do so much. And I was just like, like for like to here's one of the people that I tell people all the time. I'm like, I've never met him in person and we all met online, but I will fight somebody for to hear because of <laughs> to hear is dope. Yeah. To hear to hear is a very, very good guy. I, I, I'm not surprised at all that he did that. Yeah. So <laughs> thing that, one now this is where I really wanted to kind of kind of ask you, are you considering yourself a comedian yet? Because you should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, okay, well, here's here's the thing. I've always had a love of comedy. I, you know, grew up th as the clown in my house, in my school, and in college, we had, like, this underground arcade that had a stage and had Friday night, like, stand-up and pizza nights. So right. I, was a, I was a gigging musician, and I liked how I saw um, comedians link up and talk about jokes because it, it was almost like how they like how how we talked about songs yeah. and like I was like interested in like how they talked in the green room and how they like heard each other's jokes before it was finished and helped punch it up like I like the art form of it so I would like watch and do stand up to get the feel of it and, and stuff like that I never really had like stand up dreams you know what I mean like how everybody is just like man I want to I want two hours on Netflix. And I'm just like two hours. Ugh. Like I couldn't, I could, I don't like talking to people enough to have net to have stand-up dreams. So I, I just, I, I liked it. I, I still enjoy doing stand-up. Um, but 
I don't consider myself a comedian because like I feel like I feel like comedians like they just do a lot of stuff that I don't do. And my come up was not in comedy clubs. Like I did the open mic circuits. I did like the flappers and I, I did stuff here and there, but I wasn't like tr in the trenches. Like those people who were at like three different clubs a night till 5 a.m. every single night. Like I, I, I don't got the, <laughs> I don't got the schedule for that. But my come up was more in production, you know, like I started, um, I started as an, as an intern. And then, you know, after summer, uh, I was interning for a radio station, um, Awesomeness TV and All Deaf. And then I became a personal assistant for the VP of, of All Deaf. And then I was a PA. And then I was like, I was a, a, the equipment manager because the dude left. And I was just in this giant room with all these cameras and lights that I had no idea how to do any of it. So I was just on Google learning. And then there would be like a, a YouTube class. Cause you know, YouTube is a, like a physical place. So like <laughs> I used to go to YouTube all, all the time and they had like these classes that taught basic stuff like three point lighting and how to use a camera, how to use sound. And it was, it was really just like building it up in, in production, which is, was important for me because I learned how to shoot I learned how to do sound. I learned how to bounce light. And I didn't do any of those to be a shooter or to be a, uh, you know, somebody who does lighting like a grip or, or, or you know, a, a cinematographer or, um, or to be a sound mixer. I did it so that I knew how to talk to those people, you know, like all of those skills, even though I was okay at all of them, I knew that I wanted to be a director. I want to be a creative director. I thought I wanted to be a producer at the time. I don't want to be a producer anymore. Um, but those were, I wanted to run the show. I wanted to, I didn't want to be in every scene. I wanted to control all the scenes and put them together. So that was my, 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 my goal. And that's, that's why I brought up stand up is because like the, the same way I learned how to shoot and light so that I could talk to those people. I want, I wanted to take acting classes. I wanted to do stand up so that I understood where they're coming from. You know, if you've never been on stage making people laugh or bombing, you can't really relate as much as you, as I want to, to a comedian, same with acting. If I don't know how it, how it feels to be out there and, and for getting your lines in a scene that has a hundred lines, if I'm just a director, I could be like, oh, this guy's trash. But if I've, been, if I've been in that position, I can talk to them a different way. You know what I mean? This shit is difficult, you know? Like, well, how, how, can, how, can we, how can we work with this? So it's just kind of like, I don't, I don't consider myself a comedian because I'm not out there trying to get on people's shows. I'm not out there trying to get auditions for stuff. I, I, I just really enjoy creating stuff and giving people a, a platform, you know, whether that's a stage or a show or even just a way to get people to come to their shows, you know? Because a lot of comedians are in, like, or old school actors are just now coming around to the fact that social media is helpful, you know? And it's just like, man, if, if, we could have just worked together. You didn't have to do that split screen video where you look dumb because you were just bashing people the week before and you, you, you don't, the shit isn't lined up and all that stuff, you know, like there's different ways for everybody to, to, to do it. So I'm, I just, I, I, I respect the art and I know what I'm doing and where I am. So like, if people think that I'm funny, that's awesome. <laughs> but I, I know that I'm a, I'm a creative director and, you know, there's, you know, I, I remember when I was on when I was a PA on a, a shoot called Pedro's Auto. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I remember the director. I was watching him, and he was actually really funny. He was adding a lot of stuff to the script that wasn't there, or just like little motions that it aren't spoken. Just like that was funny, and that's when I realized I was like, oh, it 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 makes sense that the director has to be funny if he's directing comedy. You know what I mean? Like even when it comes down to post-production and I'm, when I'm, when I'm working with editors to clean stuff up or to like make things work or to cut out, like that's why I, I think it's important for me to be funny, not for me to make you laugh, but to, to be able to direct and put out stuff that has the right rhythms and the right jokes and cut the, leaving the right stuff out. Like that's the value I find in being funny, you know? Here's the perspective and reason why I ask that. So, there's two two things when I think about like the stuff that you do and kind of put it in, right? So when Jamie Foxx was doing stand up, just in general, right? He always was musical and he considered mm -hmm. musician even without an album out because he was able to create and put that out there, right? So 
I start thinking about like with you, like even though that you are more so doing creation and content and your roots came from starting from music, there's comedians on social media who only have done social media, have never hit a stage, yet you've hit multiple stages. So you may not be in the top ranks of like, oh, I'm, I'm not a top comedian, but you've done some work. You've done more than some people. Same thing like you think about like Jack Black. Jack Black is a multifaceted. He does comedy. He does, uh, I don't know if he does, if, he, if he's done any stand-up, but he does music. And it's kind of like that same thing. Like if you can legit put on a one-man show and you can do your music, you can do some podcasting, you can do a, a, a quick set real quick and it'll all fit within your realm of who you are because you've done everything within there. So that's why I was saying, I was like, plus, you know, with the content that you put out, even with amongst comedians, you are one of the funniest ones that are up there with them, right? When you're on stuff. So it comes down to, yeah, you. I, I get your humbleness because you're used to, I got to put in the work. And if I haven't put in the work, I can't consider myself a part of that profession. But you definitely have been putting in the work. Like you're just not putting in the work that you've seen other people have done. So now you're just like, you're like, okay, let me just draw it down. But again, we see it because it's like, you've hit more, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think I seen at least three stages for sure. But I was like, you probably hit more than that. I think you're probably, you probably hit 10 stages. Or like what, at what point do you start saying like, I can actually add this tag to it? Well, I mean, I guess, it, it, it comes down to like a couple of things because comedy is a is a bunch of stuff, you know. If we're specifically talking about stand up, um, then like yeah, you know, I've 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 probably hit between I don't know maybe twenty thirty, but like in the long run of things, like that's nothing. Like there are people who hit twenty thirty in a month, maybe even two weeks, like. And so I'm, I would never say that I didn't put in the work because I, I definitely did. It was just on the production side and, you know, the the content creating side, you know, like like no one can ever say that when, when people really check people on not putting in the work, it's usually somebody who's been around for a little bit and had like a couple things that skyrocketed and now they're like top tier and then but they didn't put in the work. But I know that nobody can ever tell me that, you know, I mean, obviously stand up wise, absolutely, which is why I don't consider myself a stand up comedian. Acting wise, absolutely don't consider myself an actor. But, you know, when it comes to content creation and creative directing and even just production in general, you know, like I'm kind of I'm going on six years now and the um, the intensity of it is where we really, really learn because um, our the, the thing that I love about digital media is that it's so it's so it's so much faster and it's so much it's like directly to the consumer. And, you know, I've been on, I've been on the, the, the big sets as, as well that have all the, in my opinion, extra unnecessary people. Um, but it was cool that I came from not really knowing a lot about it and I was I was thrown into digital media and then I found out about the bigger stuff because people who was in the reverse um, order of that had a really tough time adjusting. Like we had a lot of producers who were from AFI and like the top production, you know, schools in, in Hollywood and were like 300, $400,000 in school debt because, you know, they know how to produce a movie set and they know how to produce, you know, all of this stuff. But then when we give them a YouTube com content uh, contract or like a budget that, you know, we've literally had producers um, they couldn't get a project done because they didn't have enough money to have um, the the talent be in trailers. Like that was the mindset that they that they had. It had to be just like a huge production, or they didn't know what to do. Whereas me, I was just like, okay. So we were putting out a whole bunch of stuff for barely barely nothing. And I think that when you learn how to do that, you can adjust to having more a lot easier. So I, I I'm I'm really really thankful for that. And that's, that's, that's the work that I put in, you know, what I mean, I, I consider all deaf, like the burials of the internet when we started, because it was just like, we were just like the, like, we were had, we were in a garage, we were putting out a whole bunch of stuff for next to nothing. I remember, um, there was a, a couple months that I had a, an assignment to build the Facebook, but I had no budget. So I was just calling favors with people that I was doing skits with on the side. And I was just like, yo, I don't have anything. I don't have a budget, but like, if you want to come up here and shoot some skits, let's do that. And I was doing like all these skits and I built, um, 
I built up the the Facebook. There's three uh, particular videos that I put together um, that caused a lot of um, I don't know. It kind of it kind of altered all deaf a little bit. It was like a point of I was I used to do these point of view skits, and I would basically choreograph a whole scene of jokes. And I would walk through all of the jokes, and it was it was it was in summertime. It was um, being at a black barbecue point of view, being at a white barbecue point of view, and it was being at a, a Hispanic barbecue point of view. Those videos, <laughs> oh my god! I like I remember those like yesterday watching those videos. Oh, that's dope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those those were those were a lot of fun. But what it also did was, at the time, we were also because I was a brand new producer at the time. Um, all the sort of like decorated producers were, oh man, we were doing like skits that caused like five, 10 grand. We were doing like a whole bunch of crate. We were just basically throwing money away. And it made sense because that's what other companies were doing, but all those other companies were also, you know, going bankrupt as well. So that really like showed that we could start doing big level stuff. When those went viral, we could start doing big level stuff with just creative ideas that don't cost an arm and a leg. And a lot of producers fell off after that moment because it, 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 didn't, it didn't translate. So I say all that to say like, when it comes to like putting in the work or getting it out the mud on the creative side, I've seen it all. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I, you, you, you can't like, you know, some old head can't be like, well, you never, you never uh, know what it was like to drive a, 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 a truck. It's like, actually, I know I had to go wake up at 4 a.m. go to U-Haul and drive all the way to BF, you know, California to get the load all these lights that I didn't know what they were. I was like, what, Kino? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it in the truck and then take all that. Like I was really doing like some, some bottom tier stuff, you know, and, and not, not bottom tier, but I was like doing like the, the gritty hands-on on stuff i didn't just you know make a few music uh youtube videos and and go viral so that's kind of like the i mean that's not 100 percent why but that is a big reason why i stick to the creative director um title and and because that's just where i've been from you know the, no. the point i was delivering you know russell simmons his vegan drinks and stuff <laughs> as a personal assistant like that's that's what i've been putting all the work into you know it's, it's funny too, because like, that's kind of my evolution with my creativity. Like I, you know, being an artist, I would reach out for people to do my album cover. And then they were like, oh yeah, I could do that. $500. And I'm like, wait, what? So then I'm like, I was like, I can learn this myself. So I taught myself how to do graphic design. Then I'm that's like, oh, get the website done. Hey, hey, can you do my website? Sure, I could do it. $3,000. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I feel like it doesn't cost that much. So I taught right. myself how to do everything to the point where people start reaching out to me like, yo, who did y'all stuff? Yo, can we do this? I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, you know, I started doing that. And then at some point I'm like, oh, I should, I want to be a graphic designer for some of the people. What I quickly realized is that I have the, the patience to do it for myself. Like, though I like to help people, I don't think I really want to be a graphic designer. I just, it, it was a necessity because People was trying, I felt people were trying to overcharge me and I needed that for the complete packaging, right? So I took that and when we built Geek Set, like every cover of our podcast episode, because our logo is a, it looks like the Dipset logo, but instead of guns and money in the hands, it's the PlayStation, Xbox controller, it's, it's a whole thing, right? Um, so I was like, all right, every cover, I'm going to just remake a mixtape cover, but impose our heads on them. So it'd be like, if this episode, we talking about Goku and Power Rangers, it'd be the dip set cover. And you'll see like the camera and stuff with the jewels draped out. But instead of their head, it'd be our heads, the host. And then you'll see like Goku, Joel Santana. And then you'll see like, but it was just like, it, but it, it, it became a thing. And then yeah. I'm like, okay, so that's our thing, right? So even with these interviews, during the pandemic, everybody went towards Zoom. And I'm like, all right, everybody's YouTube channel is going to look exactly the same. It's going to be yeah. people in the black bars. I was like, yep. I don't want to do that. So I want to create something. So I created this overlay and created the overlay on how it looks. And then I evolved it. Next season, like, so I, do, I split them up by season. The next season, I made it look like Street Fighter. So the intro is literally look like the Street Fighter opening. And That's cool characters so this season that we're doing now it's looking like mortal Kombat. it has that mortal Kombat open and feel but again this is where i knew that i had something when i had kev on literally 
I'm speaking with Kev and he's like, oh, I'm gonna check y'all out. He started looking at, and you know, you can tell when somebody's genuinely impressed. He mm-hmm. was impressed by that. I'm just like, this guy sees, and he sees that he's a part of content damn near 24 seven. The fact that my little company impressed them in that moment, I, 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 that to me, I was like, all right, I'm going down the right path. And that's yeah. where I take that creativity, that getting it out the mud. I could have definitely tried to get somebody else to do it, but it was like, I felt like people, again, I mean, one, I, I respect people's price. So at, I'm at this level now that if I reach out to you, I'm going to pay you what your price is. But yeah. if your price is just not in the budget, I'm going to keep it a bean. I'm like, hey, I ain't got it. And so then I had to figure out how to do it on my own. And I was edit out. I created this schedule to put an uh, interview out every Saturday during the pandemic. And I was working on the oldest computer ever. And I think you will, you will understand this. For one 45 minute video, it would take at least two and a half days to render out. That was the most painstaking thing ever because I would have to do the interview and I would have to edit the interview. So if I didn't, if I didn't render it by Wednesday, that episode was coming out late. And you know, YouTube, it has like the the only way that you can really create and build your channel, you got to have some level of consistency. And so that was killing me so much. I literally was just able to upgrade within the past month and a half. And Mm -hmm. now I'm able to do more with it. But it was just like when I when I talk to other people and they talk about like things that I'm like, I feel like I'm in the get it out the mud stages. I feel like I'm paying my dues. You know, I'm, I had to work through a slow computer. Now I got a, a, a faster computer. I had to work with no guests. Now I'm getting actual, you know, big name guests and things on my on my platform. And it's actually making a name for itself. And it's actually being a thing. And I was like, I feel like that get it out the mud mentality and that, you know, doing the work is like, it's something that once you start doing it, you have a higher level of respect. Because once I started doing that, I'm like, man, all deaf, y'all was putting out stuff so much. And I was like, Man, I don't. I can. I, I know they had faster computers, but just being able to, like, it's that moment where you film the content. You're you have that level of relief, like, yeah, or we got the content. But then you're like, damn, I gotta edit this shit now. <laughs> and the editing is the yeah. is the part. It's like, oh shit, I gotta edit this shit. <laughs> no, no, that that can definitely slow slow people down. And it's like just like what you said about, you know, um, reaching out to, to people and, and hearing their price and then doing it, them, doing it yourself. Like that's, that can be, that's a very good trait to have. And it can be a very dangerous trait to preach, you know, because not everybody, it, it, it takes, it takes a very well-rounded skill set and focus to, take on every single challenge, you know? And not only that, you know, like, like for instance, you, you tell the wrong person to just like, you know, just do it all yourself, just do it all yourself, do it all yourself. You know, it, that, that can be harmful depending on who hears it. So it's like, you know, I don't like, I don't, and I also don't like to, you know, shit on the artist who, who is um, pricing themselves at what they believe their prices, you know, like how you said, like how you said, you, you, you respect their, their prices. You know, if, if somebody was like, all right, just use your example, uh, $5,000, you know, to edit this, you know, that's, that is where they are, you know, that's what they feel like they're at. And it's just really on the person who's asking to do some producing, you know what I mean? This is an opinion based game that we're in so it's like check out other stuff that they've edited check out other stuff if you're just like oh my god this is the guy figure out a way to make that five thousand work or you could look at their edit skill and be like how you said like this can't be that hard or this is not worth five thousand dollars i can try to edit myself or you don't I, i feel like it's a lot of pressure to tell somebody to just do everything themselves you can shop around, do some producing, you know what I mean? Shop around, see what other editors that are, can give you something similar are, are doing them, you know, and, and, and see if you can pay because a lot of times you are paying for the expertise, you know, uh, for instance, podcasting. You and I have similar stories in the sense that we just found we wanted to do a podcast. So we got the equipment, we set the lights up, we figured out how to make it work and we did it setting up and shooting a podcast is not difficult. It's not difficult. 
keeping a podcast going is difficult. The consistency, that's the hard part. And uh, as a side note, sometimes setting up and shooting a, a podcast can be difficult if you're not from that world. So I've, I have given that, you know, that uh, suggestion to a lot of people, uh, you know, just do it yourself, just do it yourself, just do it to yourself. And they fell off because it is a lot of hard work and it's, and it's, and it is very, very difficult. And I don't judge anybody for uh, falling off of, of consistency because it's difficult. Um, and I just, I just think that it's, it's really about delegation. You know, like if you just, if you are not the person to shoot something, try to get something going with somebody at a, some type of affordable price. If it's, if it's something where it's a, it comes down to a money issue, g- find another way to make money, pick up another job, you know, pick up a little side hustle, ha- ask yourself, how much do you want it? And the way, the one thing that I do is just like, I compare purchases. I compare purchases to what, from, from the stuff that I want and I need to do what I need to do um, to the, the, the BS that I buy. You know, if I, if I'm sitting here and I'm complaining about, man, my Twitch setup is, 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 is not what I want it to be. My lighting isn't great. I need to find out a way to get more, more like better internet, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I'm not spending what I need to spend on that. I'm not investing in that. But then it's like, I I went out to dinner this day and spent a hundred dollars or I went on Amazon and bought some random thing for 200, $250. (laughs) You gotta, you gotta compare yourself and you'd be like, okay, you're spending the money but you're not investing yourself. So it's like, I, okay, if, you don't, if you're not willing to spend the same amount of money that you're spending on this BS and taking a little sacrifice, then just admit to yourself that you don't want it that bad, you know? Did I forget the clacker out there? The I'm just gonna uh, clap. You have brought it to- I know, I'm just gonna clap. I'm yeah. mad, because I was like definitely expecting there, you to get it. I mean, I could out of me. quickly go grab it. Just hit, just clap. One, <sighs> two, three. All right, all right, all right, man. all right, 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 man. Welcome back to the Geek Set Podcast, the only podcast that blend hip hop culture and geek culture together. I'm your boy Deuces. I'm your boy Deuces. I'm your boy Deuces in the building. With me, I got my man Liv. What up? It's Liberace, the instant Puerto Rican Santa, the spicado playing, beat making, motherfucking legendary ass Puerto Rican. So Frito Papi and we back. As always, I got my man Bacardi in the building. Rind off today. We need you, I bitches. You know what I'm saying? Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate all of this. Kakashi 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 Kakashi. I hate all of this. What's good, everybody? How we doing today? And we got Dig in the building. What is happening, people? What's happening, people? What is happening, people? What is happening, people? He's out the booth. Uh, but it's, it's like I said, we are expanding. We are doing more. So they say, make sure you go to youtube.com backslash geek set. Follow us on all social media at Geek Set Podcast on every social media. Um, and th- rating reviews in, man. We are rating reviewers on Facebook, rating reviewers on Apple iTunes, rating reviewers on Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform you're looking at. Give us some ratings, let us know. Um, and then, like, again, yeah, this is the only podcast that blends hip hop culture and geek culture together. We are out. Peace. Here's where I, I, the delegation, and I think I, I often tell people that if you are building something, find somebody who's passionate about the stuff that you're not, right? And put, bring them a part of your team. So here's what, here's where, like, to bring it back full circle and why you're a good executive producer with the content that you do is because you said one of the reasons why a producer needs to be funny is because, you know, you so that way you can point it out what's funny, what's working, right? You took it upon yourself to go that route to learn comedy, to do that, you know, to kind of do those standups and stuff like that. Now that's not necessarily a part of your job title, but you did that so that way you can understand it more so that way you can be better at your job. So like one of the things that I'm really good at is social media as far as trying to market it, research and kind of putting things in a place. Cause I feel like nobody else is gonna move your content, right? So like often what a lot of podcasters do and I often tell them, I say, okay, so when you do an episode, what do you do? And they were like, well, I post it. I was like, okay. And then what else do you do with it? Well, you know, I just, you know, we, we share and everything like that. And I'm like, okay. And then I was like, how much time do you share it? Well, we do it when it drops. 
And then when the next episode dropped, we do that one. I said, so why are you not promoting it from the time that you drop this episode up until the next part of your episode? And then, you know, you're like, well, man, I'm not even on social media like that. I'm like, all right. Do you have a family member that you always see on Facebook, always see on Instagram? Bring them a part of your team, make them run your Instagram page. Or not, not make them, but have them run your Instagram page. They're already on it, so they're going to do the extra stuff that you're going to do. I do a lot of research of, like, okay, this person's writing this story about King Vader. I would love for them to know about me. Let me find this writer and reach out to them to introduce them to who I am or who we are, right? Now, I don't have to do that, but I do that. Nobody else on my team is necessarily doing that, but my guy who does our merch I signed him, uh, you know, he's been part of the podcast. I said, you run our merch. He's been buying stuff, researching stuff, doing the promo ads and everything on his own. I don't have to tell him to do it. He does it on his own because that's what he's passionate about. My brother, who's part of our podcast, he does our videos. He's watching YouTube. He's learning how to, the lighting, he's learning, he's like, we need this, we need this, and we're getting all this. And our video quality has gotten significantly better, but it's because he's doing that extra stuff that, I wouldn't have did, or my guy Bacardi wouldn't have did. My guy Liv, he's an audio engineer. Right. Why we got Pro Tools and we have Logic and we have these dynamic mics and we have all this setup and everything is because of him. He built our booth and sound quality and everything. Nice. Not because I told him to, but because that is his expertise. So I often tell people like, look, do as much as you can until you have the either capabilities to pay somebody to do it or somebody believes that much in it that they're willing to be a part of the team and mm -hmm. then delegate that way. Because then now we're operating like this. So like when it comes down to like reaching out to people, getting guests on the podcast and stuff like that, for the most part, it's me because I have the the more social engagement. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I know who to talk to and I'm, I'm reaching out to people. But it's like it works because it's like I'm going to do stuff that they're not going to do. I'm going to be the one going on blog sites, posting the link, going on, reaching out to editors, reaching out to websites, reaching out to just because I'm like, that. this is what I, and it's, it's nothing to me. It's not like it's like, oh, Monday and I got to reach. No, it's like, I do it. I'm, I do it when I'm at work. I'm literally working right now and I'm doing this because I'm like, all right, I've got my lunch break at this time. I'm going to do this lunch break. I'm going to interview Pat. I got to go. Back. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, it's one of those things like I'm going to make that sacrifice to do it because I have that much faith in it. So like I said, yeah, I don't never downplay anybody or tell anybody to do it on their own i tell them look do it on your own until you have the means to do otherwise but if you can't financially do it find somebody that can be a part of your team and have them do a part of it because it'll make it easier there's a lot of talent that's just out there if you and sometimes you just have to ask like you could be friends with somebody for years and be like oh you draw or you do graphic design you know like there's there's so much talent that and if you guys have um aligned views it can be a per like okay perfect example my buddy will ferrell okay I interview will. will will ferrell he, oh he was he was on the show and roxy was on the show shout out okay shout out to, to shout out to both of them okay roxy too but will i go a little bit further back with and you know he kind of just was that guy who did anything to get to get to work you know what i mean he would drive crazy amounts of miles just to come through and, and work on some stuff. And obviously we we noticed that, but his his passion was graphic design and he was making his own shows and stuff like that, like Hotbox Challenge. If you're like a true Will Ferrell fan, you know that Hotbox Challenge was just a little segment of a way bigger show with like 10 segments in it um, that he had. And, you know, he, he had me on the show a couple of times. And at the time I was, um, I was, uh, I think it was, I think that was the time that I had like an actual slot of like how many shows I could have. And um, because every, it was, I think we were dropping like two shows a week. And I was just like, well, I, I've never done this before, but if you take that segment out and expand on it, I'll give you one of my slots. And obviously he got right to work, did that, designed it itself, and then it did really well on the channel. So me and him started working a little bit more together and he was a blurred, just like me. He was a black nerd. He was into video games. I've always wanted to do a video game podcast because I knew, like, I, I, I'm very, like, forward thinking. And I saw when All Deaf was getting traction that comedy was going to be a for sure thing. Now I can go into my other interests, like gaming and stuff like that. So I, I started, like, doing, like, these little shows on, on the channel to see if our audience even wanted gaming. So 
he was definitely one of those people who was uh, super into it, but his passion was graphic design. He went to school for it. So we just linked up and started um, Arcade Tokens, which is literally what you were talking about before, um, in, earlier in the show about how like there's not a lot of representation. We were just like the token black guys. So we were doing the, this, this podcast. We would go to his house, shoot it ourselves. It was very, very minimum. He was doing the graphic arts, doing all the like the the art stuff and the um like sort of like the uh, the postings. Like he does a lot of work uh, for for these channels behind the scenes, and that's where I suck at, you know, because all Def has a team for that. So I, I you know I help with the creative, I help with the shooting and stuff like that. I help with the you know notes and the post, but in terms of like the art and the posting and stuff like that, he was doing that like crazy. So he pretty much got the practice of doing it for arcade tokens for like a long time. I want to say we were doing it for like two years before we got on with another company. And the first thing that they noticed was the consistency. You know, they noticed that we were going and then we added Cleo Thomas like a little bit halfway through. And, you know, Cleo's, um, his, his expertise is on camera hosting, on camera talent. So now that boosted us in that level. So it was really just like talent that kind of believed in the same thing. And we all just can kind of like bounce back and forth with like the, the the duties and responsibilities because we all cover different things. So it's really like you said, like kind of like Avengers style, uh, putting a team together. And if you can't do everything yourself, find like either collabing with people or just reaching out to people who you can figure out a way to pay, you know, but it's really just about like planting those seeds and just keeping them watered because at some point, cause we were getting like, there was a point in time we were getting like a hundred to 500 views for like, a year, year and a half, two years straight, you know, and we had to just kind of like keep it going to the point where it's like, okay, now that there's an op opportunity to run a gaming channel, we know exactly what to do. We just switched over, we just switched our, you know, focus over and did it again. And then, you know, I'm, I'm working with another company called Gaming While Black and I'm me, myself and another creative director are pretty much putting the, the first like, you know, foundations out and it's like, you know, we're working with Doritos and it's like when me and when, when Will and I first started Arcade Tokens, it was the goal to like make our way into the world of black gaming. So it, it, if you really believe in it, it's like putting an investment in and you, you can't expect to get your money back for a minute. But when you do, it's exactly where you want it to be. And that's what I hang my hat on. I hang my hat on consistency. So a couple of things that I asked that I, that I was like, all right, one of my goals and Will had posted this photo and it was Jaw. I think if I'm not mistaken, it was King Vader, Caleb City, Long Beach Griffey. It was just like a collect. I think, I don't know if it was one of y'all things that y'all was doing with the, uh, where y'all was just bringing a whole bunch of people together and doing content. Uh -huh. But I had commented on it. I said, my goal is that within the next year or so, that next time something like this happened, we are a part of it. Because the way I look at it is, I said, there's, there's a couple of us fighting the same fight. Our DC world, they're killing it right now, doing amazing things. They're fighting this fight. King Vader and them, they are fighting this fight. RK Tokens, you guys are fighting this fight. Um, Roxy, you know, and everything, the Blurred Girl. So it was like, there's a lot of these black geeks, you know what I'm saying, that are, you know, what's good. And then like, there's a lot of people that are fighting this fight at the same time. And I see a lot of you guys collab. And so I was like, I want Geek Set to be amongst that. I want that, I often say, I said, I want when people start naming things and they got to include the black people uh, or the black geeks. It's like, okay, we're going to do something with black geeks. All right. So we got to get RK tokens. We like, I want us to be a gimme. Like, okay. We, we, we know we got to get geek set. We know we got to get RK token. Like that's what I want companies to start thinking of. Not so they got to do the research. I want us to be the gimme. Like, all right, we know that we can, if we don't do it with them, it's fraudulent. Like that's kind of my goal. And like, right. I, you know, and I often big up a lot of y'all on purpose because I want people to know that even when people get introduced to us, you know, people are like, oh man, I love y'all. Hip hop culture, geek culture, man, it's crazy. And I'm like, no, oh, it's really not crazy. And I often rattle off who you guys are. You know, like I said, it's kind of like automatic. Like, okay, yeah, let me introduce you to other people as well. Like we just did an interview and I dropped, name dropped y'all, RDC World, King Vader and Roxy. And I was like, because there's a lot of us. And I say, when you watch them and you see them again, same thing. It's not Urkel. Everybody that I just named don't look like what mainstream media is trying to push. And that's right. 
And that's what I keep on trying to tell more and more people. We have a good connection with Crunchyroll. Same thing. We've been covering their Crunchyroll Expo. So, you know, we were covering it. They'll reach out to us for stuff like that. And we got this good relationship with them. And a lot of the times, like I said, they already know King Vader, of course, but a lot of the times when they ask about other creators, I'm name dropping other because I said, I don't want to be one, I don't want to be a gatekeeper. Two, I want to kind of bring it together, you know, because of hip hop and knowing that like the XSL freshman cover, I got this vision. I always said, I said, if I got this vision that if somebody reached out to me and said, hey, we want to do a magazine cover with Geek Set, I'm like, if you I got this plan. I'm like, if you want to really make this pop, let me let's bring up all these people and do like a freshman style cover. Like, like my vision is that like, OK, we have a freshman style cover of us, y'all, uh, RDC World and King Vader all on one cover. And the cut and the article is not just about geeks. And now it's about the new black geek or whatever that is and things like that. And that's kind of like these dreams and aspirations that I have. But it is because of that representation that you guys do, that consistency, the, the the output, the product. It's like, it's this whole vision that I have that I'm trying to complete at some point in my life. So yeah. That's, dope. that's awesome. That's really, really cool that you do that. And it's good that you kind of like know what, you know, where you kind of want to go. And, you know, just from, just, you know, from my, from my experience at the table with, certain brands yeah a lot of a lot of times our way in the door is going to be like the black x you know we need the black blah blah blah, the black blah blah blah. but you know for instance like g4 the channel g4 it was like the first video game channel we always say that it was way ahead of its time we were not ready for that yet um the minority that we got was like the asian woman on attack of the show and they they kind of were like, they were pretty misogynist to her. You know, they had her like in mud wrestling and stuff like that. And so like that kind of, since that was the only gaming thing and you know, you, you we didn't have like social media and stuff like that. It almost made it seem like there were no black nerds, you know? So, I, you know, hopefully it gets to a point where the, 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 ob- the objective isn't necessarily to be the black in the black conversation as opposed to just being in the conversation if you need you know forget about if you need black geeks you know if you need black geeks obviously we need rdc world blah 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 blah. but it's just like if we need geeks if we were to bring back g4 which i hear is happening um but if we were to bring back or if, if g4 were to come back and it had just black hosts i don't want a black show on g4 i just want black representation because you know, who knows how I would have thought if there were just a bunch of black hosts on G4 when I was growing up, you know, and we just have to think about that because we're not only making stuff for people that are our age that can come up and congratulate us in the street. We're making a bunch of content for people in, you know, fifth grade, middle school, high school, who are basically like looking at these people and coming up like that. So it's, it's, it's very important to to, to have dreams where you're you're in the conversation, but we should all take it a step further and not just be in the black conversation. Like, no, nah, we need to be in the conversation, period. Oh, did you know that Punchy was going to take off as it did? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't, I literally, um, I didn't plan to do more than one skit. Um, I just, I had the idea of like a, a regular dude trying to sign up and seeing the, the sign up sheet. And that was pretty much it. And then I was just like, okay, I'll do a trilogy. And then I had a couple more ideas. And then it just got to a point where I had like a whole series. Like I had just like a whole bunch of ideas for Punchy. And then I kind of just like put it down and I was just like, okay, this might be a little too much. I'm going to just, you know, have these five really, really funny ones or however many I did. And, you know, I, I think I am going to do like a couple here and there, but I think at the, at the time there was a lot of pressure to just like keep it going. And then now my page is just like punchy. And it's like my, my, between my schedule and just like what I want my page to be, like, I want my page to be just like, like everything. I don't like, there's a lot of pages that you go to for gaming or you go to for this, but like, um, you know, I, I try to diversify what I'm, what I'm doing. So I am planning on, you know, bringing skits back, um, but I don't really commit to any one series or else it looks like my page is about that only. 
it's, and it's funny because it, it starts off with such a small idea you know like punchy like it was like right. like even when you did like i i was showing my uh my team i was like look at this about weeds i was like who thinks of this because it was just hilarious it was like other weeds and then tumbleweed like oh the tumbleweed one yeah <laughs> I, I, I laughed so hard at that because it was just hilarious to me. Like, come out. <laughs> like, that, should, that had me in tears so much. I don't, I don't really know where that came from. I mean, it's, I am sort of a psychopath, but I do want to say that, like, I did see a tumbleweed and I. <laughs> <laughs> I whenever I see something weird I always just go to like what what is what does anybody else think of this or what was the first person to think to do this so I mean that in a way that was similar to punchy because that kind of was just a small idea that led to um, a new style of something like now I just kind of like now I'm doing like these skits that are aren't taking up the full minute maybe like 20 30 seconds um, of just like based in either inanimate objects or like a bug you know like i felt like that was like a, a fun thing to do but that was another thing i slowed down i had like 30 ideas and i was just like hang on hang on let it breathe bring back pat geo and gaming stuff and then come back to it you know like i i didn't want to just you know I, and it, there's no pros and cons to that method either i just have random strategies like that <laughs> Sir, i was leading the the charge of i felt like mortal kombat stole your plot because that's is basically <laughs> What them make in the new Mortal Kombat movie was basically a regular nigga who got introduced to Mortal Kombat. Like, wait, what? Like, wait, wait. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? When I got into anime, uh, which was within the last like three, four years, um, because you know, shout out to Nami, where I started, um, I started uh, working with this company that it's pretty smart. He's like an anime fan, and uh, he he takes his he takes certain pieces uh, out of animes and makes them into like actual wearable stuff. And um, I started, you know, um, working with them and modeling their stuff. And now I'm walking around with a Naruto puffer jacket and I don't know everything about Naruto. I'm going to get, I'm going to get like exposed out here. So I started watching a lot of them and I noticed like I watched Naruto and I was like, oh, this is really, really cool. And I watched another series and then I watched another series and I watched another series and I was like, oh, this is all about the, this is the exact same show. And since I think formulaic and in terms of like formatting, I'm like, okay, they pretty much just took the story of Rock Lee, you know, a regular person in a ninja school and remixed it. Now we got an anime where it's a, uh, a regular person in a superhero school, regular person in a wizard school, regular person in a cooking school. You know, like they're surrounded by all these people with ad, ad, um, advantages and natural gifts and they just have to use hard work and stuff like that. Well, that's that's dope because that's a big thing in uh, Japanese culture and, and, and Chinese culture, whether it's movies or or, or cartoons, it's just, it comes down to hard work, hard work, hard work. It doesn't matter about what other people have, hard work, hard work, hard work. And I've always respected that, but it's almost like in anime, Naruto was like the young thug, you know, it just set this new standard. And now there's just like all these copies and a lot of them are good, you know, like that's, I feel like that's why it's so rinse and repeat. So I just felt like Punchy was in a way I didn't know it at the time, but it was about to be that for Mortal Kombat. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really a very, you know, very done anime uh, plot. And this this is what I, I was kind of let now about the learning that because about your anime nuance of being new to anime, because up until I think you for the longest, I thought Cloud Village, Cloud Village was because of Naruto. And then you had said on, I, I forgot what, it was something that you said. You was like, no, it wasn't based off, it wasn't based off of any anime product. And I was like, what? I was like, this whole time, I thought it was because I'm like, oh, Cloud Village, Pat's a nerd. I was like, oh man. This one. Uh, here, here's why I want to give Cloud Village its credit because Cloud Village, I feel like the reason why it got so, because I, I feel like I've, I've had IG and, and YouTube for a minute and I've had like a lot of, really, really dope fans who were always popping in and leaving comments. But it was, I, I, I credit it all to Twitch. Twitch was everything, you know, Twitch was really that one platform where it wasn't just me doing something, editing it and then throwing it out there and then checking comments when I could, you know. And then when I did my podcasts that were live, 
you know, I would be talking about my own stuff and I would be getting their opinions and their, their input on everything, but it was really all me talking, you know, like that's, that was like mostly my, it wasn't me talking to them. It was me talking and then they would say something and then I would say like a response back, but it wasn't like a conversation and Twitch really like sat me down and, you know, I wasn't even, you know, the first pandemic, the, the cloud, people in the cloud village will tell you, I didn't promote anything. I would just go live. And if you were available, you, you came in. And if you weren't, you, you didn't. And I would just be on there for like four or five hours, just like chopping it up with them. And a lot of them um, are, you know, based on the things that I, I, I release, a lot of them are anime fans, gamers, you know, like into like a lot of the same cool things that I'm into. And at the time, and Cloud Village, we don't get enough credit for this, but all that zooming with the homies, naming people with the emojis, that came from the village. And I'll tell you why, because <laughs> I was I was thinking about um, musicians like Rihanna and Lady Gaga and stuff, and all these people who had names for their fan bases, because that that's obviously, that's been around, you know? But I was just like, man, I want one too. And we were just kind of like brainstorming stuff. And I was literally just talking to my chat and it was the, the, the runner ups were awful. It was like cloud troopers. It was like cloud, it was weird, some weird stuff. Um, but uh, I was like the word village, um, I tribe called quest fan and, you know, tribe village. I always, you know, like that word. And since they were anime fans, they, you know, were always referencing Naruto village of the clouds and all that stuff. And so when we really like locked in on Cloud Village, obviously the cloud was the emoji. And I remember the day where I was playing and I was like, oh shit, it's 7.15. I was supposed to be on uh, Zooming with the homies. I was late and I basically brought, I was just like, yo, y'all come to Zooming with the homies. And I basically brought um, all everybody to into Zooming and the clouds thing were going and I was all excited. And I told them about Village and uh, then, yeah, then Tahir and I did Scary Squad cause I felt like we needed one. And then that made more mob. And then I think just zooming with the homies became sort of like the place that everybody stopped through. And I remember that episode. I don't know why I soon. So I was part of the more mob first. Mm -hmm. and I got part of the more mob after. So I had to go back and watch some zooming with the homies because I kind of missed like the evolution of it. I wasn't around for the first few ones. And so uh -huh. then. I did see that episode of where all the clouds and everything, but I assumed the more mob was already popping because by the time I got on, when I was got jumped into Discord, it was already popping. So I assume I so I apologize because I have I've been telling this story for the longest and I've been giving all the praise to the more mob this whole time. <laughs> I mean, to, to be fair, like me and Tahir do stuff all the time. It's a lot of the same people, you know. And and it's it's really the people that are doing all of this. I'm I'm just I'm just you know messing with you guys. But it did start in the in the village, and those same people went over to Zoom and was giving out emojis and stuff like that. I wasn't like behind the scenes curating like okay, give so and so a fan base. So and so that was all the people. So you know I I, I I'm pretty because I I don't think more mob even happened until a little bit later. But Scary Squad uh kind of became a thing. And um, yeah, I want, I want to say that Zooming with the home, that's why I love Zooming with the homies because it just became like, like you, it almost made you wish that the pandemic was still happening. Cause like, it really was just like, it, first, first of all, that was, that was a show I was just like, oh, to hear it's a talk show host. Like he could be like a Jay Leno, easy, easy. And it, it, it also just became such like a community. Like, first of all, every day, seven to nine is insane. To hear is a crazy person for even doing that. Mm -hmm. um, even if that's your only, the only thing you're doing, that's a very tough schedule. So you throw a world tour in there, <laughs> gets a little, gets a little busy. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it really just became that thing that not only um, shared his audience and, and like, put on like a lot of uh not like I wouldn't say new comics but just like new to that uh that audience and new to, to sort of like the, the social media thing I think it did help like a lot of people and it helped people with branding and stuff and I just like that you know regardless of where or when like that that whole community and just that um mindset of like hey what's up nice to meet you what what are your people called what emoji you want is 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 awesome because it's like these 
branding is something that a lot of people struggle with. It's not really an easy thing to do. It's not easy to brand yourself. So the fact that these people understand it and they can literally look at you and be like, um, scissors emoji. <laughs> and it's just like, now you got the scissor squad or whatever the hell it is. Like, even if that's not what you end up rolling with, it's, it's, it's a start that a lot, of, it's, it's, a, it's hard for a lot of people to do. And if, it's, if, if that's what makes you even develop your first t-shirt, that's a really, really big deal. Yeah. Speaking of merch, I mean, you are a monster in the merch game, like right now in my eyes. Like, Protect Your Light is so dope. Like, you know, with everything that we're trying to do with this geek brand, I'm like, man, duh. like, I'm, I'm what again, I, I'm a student of the game. I watch the things that certain people do that I think are doing it dope. And I'm like, okay, what can I learn from this? And I'm just seeing, like, I was like, one of the things that I was like, I was like, fam, we keep on just focusing on just the merch. We got to focus on the lifestyle. And I'm like, fam, Pat, he literally just be posting something. It'd be him at a stoplight in the merch, but it's like, it's such a dope image. And it kind of, it, it goes on with the brand. So I'm like, I'm trying to figure out ways to incorporate geek and try to find what, or what is that lifestyle? How can we portray that? But it was, it was just really dope to kind of to see that and just kind of, again, like not directly learning from what you're doing, but learning from what you're doing by just like seeing everything that you're doing. Um, so speaking of Scary Squad and then speaking of Pat Geo, I got some things that I wanted to, some stories that I wanted to tell you about because I'm like, I wonder does Pat know this and everything like that. Okay. So, super random. Did you know that people are more likely to be killed by a champagne cork than a poisonous spider? No. Champagne cork is really specific. <laughs> how many, well, now I gotta know, like how many deaths? Not, Does a, a champagne court cause deaths? But um, but I was just like that was a random fact. I, I was like people is like you are more likely to be killed by a champagne court than you are by a poisonous spider, and that's like that is yeah. a that's also it's also on the list for a shark. There are twenty four deaths a year from champagne corks, and that's less than sharks too. Wow, that's very interesting. Here's another thing: <laughs> ten thousand people die each year on the toilet due to winter hazards. And I said, due to what? winter hazards, like just, I guess, winter weather, or I'm not for sure. They didn't go into detail of it, but I was winter like, hazards. that's a lot of people dying on the toilet that I thought was wildly like, and I don't- What is a winter habit? That's I, wild. Winter hazard. I'm assuming that it's just, well, see here's the thing. What, what I'm assuming is, they're on the toilet and it's just way too cold and then you end up freezing to death. But I was like, that is a horrible way to go. I was like. Yeah, I feel like if it was that cold, why are you taking a boo-boo? I don't know. Now you... this, this other one, I was like, okay, with your hatred of the sea and, okay. and, and large bodies of water, did you know that lakes can literally explode? Because of what? No, in general, did you know that lakes can just literally explode? No. It's called a limic eruption, L-I-M-I-C. It's a rare type of natural disaster in which dissolved carbon dioxide suddenly erupts from deep within lake waters, forming a gas cloud capable of suffocating wildlife, livestock, and humans. It would suffocate them? Yes. I said, I said, and I was like, when I read that, I immediately thought of, I'm like, Pat hates large bodies of water. And this is another thing of the water is out to kill you. <laughs> it's like, it's just. This it happens gonna, naturally? It's naturally. <laughs> this is the most, it's the most wildest thing. And I said, what? I said, why, why would this even be a thing? Because it's, it's so wild. I'm looking at it right now. That is insane. All right. I've never even heard of this. Although the lakes that they're they're showing me are very suspect looking. They look like <laughs> bubbling, bubbling vats that I wouldn't jump into anyways, but that is that is insane. That is very weird. when you think of, when you think of the earth, what colors come to mind? Blue and green. Blue and green. Did mm -hmm. you know that the earth used to be purple? I didn't look up why, but they say that the earth used to be purple. On some Cameron purple haze type shit. <laughs> As in like before the gases that we ruined and everything. I'm assuming so. I'm assuming that's why I didn't look up why. I just saw like there was like random facts of the earth and it said the earth used to be purple. And I said, what? I said, why did the earth used to be purple? And that was just a, a random fact about that. 
Ancient microbes might have used a molecule other than chlorophyll to harness the sun's rays that gave organisms a violet hue. Now this, this the, the, the last fun one I got, if someone was to scavenge the ocean in general, about how much money do you think is down there? Scavenge the ocean? Oh man, with with pirates and uh, how it's crazy. At one point before planes, everything in the world was shipped by a boat, and the fact that anything from the kraken to just a storm could overturn a boat. Trillions? Are there? Is there billions? It's definitely trillions. It's estimated about seven hundred and seventy-one trillion dollars worth of gold is within the ocean. Probably just recorded, huh? It might be way more than that. Definitely, maybe way more than that. What was they doing? I wonder, are they talking about like literal pirate treasure gold coins or like the value of certain cargo too? It could, it could be valid. I, I'll, when I read it, did you say it's uh, $771 trillion worth of gold is within the ocean? Ooh, I ain't looking for it, but that is that is mysterious. <laughs> And it's crazy that with all the exploration and all the technology we have, we are still not really finding that much. Like, how would you even do that? All right. So the last segment that we got on, on this, we do, we do um, which quick, it's a top five. So because of your, you have a wide range of music. I do want to get, who are your top five musicians? It could be any category, any realm. It doesn't have to be in order, but who are top five artists for you? Well, I'm so glad you didn't make me do this in order. I would say um, the Beatles, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Mad Lib, including Quasimodo, uh, Erica Badu, and okay, if we're talking about musicians. Ah, uh, that's that's tough to say. It would be between Pharrell and Lil Wayne. Okay. Uh, Pharrell more on sculpting the production of of my life, and Lil Wayne sculpting the how every rapper is in my life. Okay. Um, if we just talking about just straight up like, that's all like respected stuff that I draw off of. But in terms of just like fun and stuff, I'm really into like Young Thug and Playboy Cardi right now. <laughs> All right. That's not that's not like top, but you know, obviously. And okay, so now with you three years, you say about three years you're into anime and everything. What are your top five animes? Again, it doesn't have to be in order, but just and it could be currently that you're watching or whatnot, but your top five animes. Okay. So every time I, I bring up anime, there's always the um there's always the conversation of inclusion of Dragon Ball Z and Pokemon. Okay. Are those considered Cartoons or animes in this question? Anime. I consider them anime. You can see we, we love Dragon Ball. So do I. So do I. And I hate when people don't. Um, I, those two, not even close. Um, since I've gotten back into it, I'm a big fan of Cowboy Bebop. Um, Naruto is just very good. I really like Naruto. And I like five uh, Seven Deadly Sins. Seven Deadly Sins is pretty good. Have you? I used to be really into Attack on Titan, uh, but last season was I used to like, yeah, when it was like they were creepy monsters and no one knew where they came from, the show was really, really good. When they when the monsters started talking and you started learning too much about them, I I, I wasn't into it anymore. Cool. Um, Demon Slayer, Slayer is also really fun. I like Demon Slayer. Um, there's two animes that I wondered, did you have? So, have you watched Dr. Stone yet? No. Okay, do you, are you familiar with it? Uh-uh. So this is something I think you would actually like. So Dr. Stone, what happens is some catastrophic event happens and everybody gets turned to stone. And then okay. hundreds, hundreds of years pass, wildlife took back over the earth, and then mysteriously this kid wakes up. Now he's a very, very into us, intelligent kid, very, very smart kid. And so he is, he tasks himself to bring science back to the world and get the world back up and running to where it's at. Now, again, remember hundreds of years past, 
Nobody knows what turned into stone or, or why. And because he is very, very smart, he's using science to do like just basic stuff, like create, you know, um, you know, how to, you know, build stuff and how to create, recreate electricity. So as he's going through his journey, there are new people that are also born within this world who never knew about the old world. So they are in the stone age type of mindset. And he's introducing them to science. And then wow. the whole show has this balance of, you know, science versus modern, like just like regular, like, you know, just grunt work and stuff like that. And it becomes that battle. It's a really, really dope story, a really, really dope anime that I think is dope. Also, Dr. Stone. And also, have you tried Assassination Classroom? I keep hearing about that. I do keep hearing about that. Assassination Classroom is so good. You know, so you already know about it, right? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, that, those two, when, uh, I believe that you would like those a lot, I believe. Wait, so question, is that show about a school full of assassins? Yes and no. So what happens is this alien destroys the moon and turns into a crescent, right? Everybody sees it and everything. So he lands in this, in this world and it's just like, he's just this crazy, strong, fast alien. So he says, I am going to do what I did to the moon, to the earth in a year. But here's the caveat. Let me be the, the teacher of this class of students. And their task is you guys have a year to assassinate this teacher, otherwise the world is over. And so he's he's like, look, I, I don't mind. Like, look, I, I know I'm crazy strong. If you guys can figure out how to kill me within a year, you guys win. If not, I'm destroying the earth. He just had like a creative suicide plan. Yeah. And so, but it's it's a really dope anime. It's so good. Wow. Yeah. That, that I've never heard a villain propose <laughs> so many like so many options to kill him. He's like, I oh, know I'll train everybody. <laughs> I just want you. Somebody needs to kill me. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Okay, that's that's has a that's a very unique plot. I like that. I also I'm, I'm I'm getting into the old school ones. Like I'm I love Bleach. I I couldn't really say that because I'm not, I'm not far enough to really say like oh that's my favorite. Um, but Bleach was just like one of those things on Toonami that I ignored because like I was all Dragon Ball Z or nothing, you know? Um, but when I went back and I was like, the, this is the premise? Like you're fighting ghosts? That's awesome. So I'm really getting back into like the old school ones too, but I am trying to get into like, what's the uh, Clover something? Black Clover? Black Clover. I'm, I'm trying to like that character, but it's, it's a little slow. Uh, <laughs> And I'm 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 gonna check out Assassination Classroom and um, uh, the Food Wars one. The Food Wars ones. Those are the ones I wanna I wanna watch more, but I've just I just haven't had the time yet. Watch that, those other random ones. Like I watched one called The Way of the House Husband, and it's literally this assassin. He used to be an assassin. Then he makes a decision like I'm done. I'm going to be the best house husband ever. But he treats it like an assassin, like like his assassination assignment. So he's yelling at his wife like, oh, "I'm sorry, I, I I failed." He's like, and he's like, "Should I take my life?" And she's like, "No, you just forgot to put the dishes in the sink." And he's like, oh, "Okay, I'll put it." <laughs> that <laughs> sounds like something I would not watch. <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie. It's so random. It is so random and, and crazy. I was like, "I'm just gonna watch it, and try it out." That's so funny. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I had a thing where I was like, okay, let me watch the first five episodes of every anime that I can get on my streaming things, just so I can give them a chance. Because obviously the first the first episode of any series isn't a fair chance because they're just trying to set everything up. Like it's not going to be as cool or as funny or whatever. So I try to give it like five episodes and if it doesn't get me. It's, it's See, you're better than me. I got to at least watch the full first season of anything. No matter what, I've watched so many crappy shows and animes and movies and and everything and then video games is the worst i cannot not beat a game if i start a game no matter how trash it is i have to complete it otherwise it'll bug me out of my mind even if it's like cuphead level hard yes yes dude i listen here i played glover to completion and glover is so trash because i thought glover is not trash what I, oh wait a minute wait okay before i get into that the, I, I know i gotta let you go but I had two ideas that I was like, dang, but they're so close to you guys and stuff that you do that I was like, I, I can't launch it. But you should do like a geek blasphemy because there's so many 
Gamer There's, blasphemy. Yeah, that, that's coming up. No, we were we just we're starting the expansion, but blasphemy is gonna be doing we definitely doing gamer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that in hopes that at any time, if you guys are ever to reach out to me, I have some loaded for both black blasphemy, geek blasphemy. Like I've been like I like I told you, I envision stuff. So I envision, I've, I've said it on Twitter. I said, I'm about speaking things in existence. I said, I'm one of these days, I'm going to be on Black Blasphemy. And I said, I got the perfect <laughs> one and I got, and, I, and I'm ready for this. Um, and then another thing, man, literally probably like two months before y'all launched it, I was like, man, I want to play old school games. I got, and I bought the Nintendo 64. And then I was like, oh, we're going to do retro gaming on the Geek Said Twitch. And then like, Two weeks or three weeks after I had the idea, you guys were just doing a whole but I was like, damn it. I was like, they beat me to it. I well, like, I mean, to be honest, like we retro games is a very, very popular, you know, we didn't invent retro games. So it's just like, you know, something that broad, retro games, like we wouldn't feel any retro games is like you anybody can do that. You know, it's, it's kind of like what we were talking about before, like nothing's really new under the sun it's just about what you can bring to it what you can bring to it to make it your own because it's like you know even if we did have the only retro show ever you wouldn't want the same show on your channel anyways you know because if it's the exact same thing you would want something that brings out why you're running it you know you kind of want those things that make it its own thing anyways so you know i wouldn't even worry about that even if we were the first person to do it but i mean it's retro gaming you know if that's what you want to do do that <laughs> The style and the way y'all did it, it was similar to how I envisioned it. So I was like, we just got to tweak it and figure it out. But then I was like, but other than that, I was like, or we just got to figure out a way that we can game with them. Like, that's like, like I was like, we hey, can that's just as possible. <laughs> but um, all right, man, where can my people find you? Um, Yeah, I, I'm pretty much at Patrick Cloud on all platforms. Uh, you know, we were talking about all deaf gaming and arcade tokens. So subscribe to that for, you know, additional gaming content. If you're more on the comedy side, you know, all deaf has a, a main channel and a comp comedy channel. Uh, also, you know, gaming while black is another channel that I'm, I'm working on. So, you know, definitely subscribe to that. But, you know, if not Patrick cloud on everything. <laughs> all right, well, this has been one on one with deuces. I've been your boy Deuces. This is Geek Set, the only place that blend hip hop culture and geek culture together. It's been an amazing Patrick Cloud, and we are Flawless out. Victory.